You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we've heard from the lawmakers. Let's bring on a journalist now who's been covering this bill. McKenna Schuler is a reporter for Orlando Weekly. She's also a former anchor and reporter for WMNF. Welcome back to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, McKenna. Thanks for inviting me on, Sean. It's really good to see you. Remind our audience what's in this bill, SB 256 and HB 1445. So there's quite a few things in this bill, but as I've reported for Orlando Weekly pretty extensively, some of the main things that are really concerning labor unions and workers just broadly um, who benefit from their public sector unions is a ban on automatic payroll deductions of union dues, which is already something that if you are a union member that you um, sign up for willingly. Um, And then the other primary thing concerning people is a 60% membership uh, requirement, a threshold that unions have to meet in order to remain certified or valid, so to speak. And that's actually different from previous iterations that have been proposed in previous legislative sessions here in Florida, where it's typically been a 50% membership threshold. So I think a lot of what I've heard from union leaders is it feels like an escalation this year in that regard. So we just heard from Republican Joe Gruders. He spoke against the bill. Most of his colleagues voted for the bill. So what is Joe Gruders just a, a union activist in the Republican Party or something? Um, I would say that I've heard from union leaders that there are, you know, a handful of Republican allies in the state legislature. So I wouldn't call him a pro-union activist, but I haven't talked to the man myself, so I can't say. And we got an email just now from Bubba who says that this bill is retribution against teachers, plain and simple. And he says, I know so many people are leaving the profession because of politicians sticking their nose where it doesn't belong. And uh, he goes on to say things I won't be able to say on the radio. But so what do you think about that idea, especially um, this bill applies to public sector unions, of which teachers are certainly a large public sector union but it exempts firefighters and police unions. So what's that story? Yeah, so this bill has broadly been interpreted as an attack on teachers unions specifically and um, why people think that. For one thing, as you mentioned, teacher unions do make up a significant chunk of Florida's unionized public sector workforce. So over 150,000 teachers, support staff, and other school staff are covered by the statewide teachers unions and their smaller unions throughout the state. Um, But it also feels politically motivated because DeSantis himself, Governor DeSantis, has sort of attacked teacher unions himself. And some people think that that's in retaliation for teachers unions endorsing his Democratic opponent, Charlie Crist, last year. And his Christ's running mate, of course, was also a teacher's union president herself. So it does feel very targeted. And that's actually not a very Florida specific thing either. This is something that has happened in other states as well. Um, Oklahoma, for instance, also has legislation this year that targets public sector unions, but actually specifically teachers unions. They don't even bother just saying the entire public sector. But As far as the carve out, that has also been something that's not unique to Florida that is present in a lot of similar legislation that's been proposed in different states throughout the country. But it also feels politically motivated, I think, or that's how it's interpreted, because um, police unions and firefighter unions, for instance, commonly endorse um, Republicans for office and generously donate to their campaigns. Um, As far as firefighters and police speaking out against the bill. I actually read a an article recently, I think it was UF's student newspaper, The Alligator, where they actually did get a firefighter union leader on record um, saying opposing the bill and saying that other public sector unions shouldn't have to, you know, deal with this kind of um, attack on their union rights. Our guest is McKenna Schuler. She's a reporter for Orlando Weekly, and this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. McKenna, Florida is what's called a right-to-work state. So remind people what that means 
and why that aspect of it makes this bill even more uh, confounding for labor rights groups. Yeah, so one interesting thing actually being able to report on this bill more extensively is kind of being able to educate, I guess, inform people, again, what right to work is and how it relates to this legislation. So because right to work, I think, is commonly confused with other concepts like at will employment. And I would say put simply right to work means that in Florida and over a couple dozen other states um, that have similar policies, an employee working in a unionized workplace can reap the benefits of having a union without having to financially support union activities through paying dues, such as uh, collective bargaining. So you don't have to sign up to be a union member to benefit from what it can do for you. And actually because of a US Supreme Court ruling in 2018, Janus versus AFSCME, the entire US public sector is also broadly right to work as well. Um, and this is a policy that first emerged in the South and Florida was actually the first state to bake it into its state constitution along with uh, the right of public sector workers to collectively bargain. So why it's relevant to this legislation is I've heard and sp spoken to many union organizers, union staffers, and just uh, broadly union workers who say that right to work makes it a lot more difficult to reach the 60% membership threshold that these bills propose. And that's because, um, because with right to work, you don't have to be a union member to benefit from the contract. So there's less incentive to do so. But what right to work, to, what right to work does in general that um, is problematic for unions is that it's generally pushed by conservatives in elected leadership positions and anti-union power players more broadly. It's meant to reduce the financial resources unions have to actually support a strong fighting union, which in effect also makes unions less appealing and creates what some critics call a free rider problem. And what you're referring to is that if either meeting the 60% or the 50% threshold might be difficult if you just, there's no incentive for you necessarily to, you could get the benefits of being in a union without bothering to join up or without bothering to pay the the fees. And so um, that's what you're referring to there as the, the free rider. Yeah, and I should also mention too that under a 2018 law here in Florida, teachers unions are already required to meet a 50% threshold. So a lot of them, they're between it. They have at least the minimum 50%. I think there might be one teachers union in the state that's kind of like facing issues that people, if this um, if this bill were to pass where they don't meet that requirement, they would have to recertify. Um, but so all of the teacher unions in the state effectively, almost all um, are between, or at least 50%, but there are a lot that are you know, just on that 50% that they fought to get there because of the 2018 bill that was signed into law by former governor, Rick Scott. Our guest is McKenna Schuler, a reporter for Orlando Weekly. You can read her work at orlandoweekly.com. She used to be a reporter and anchor here at WMNF. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, reporting here, uh, broadcasting here from WMNF in Tampa. So in the Senate, right before the bill passed, there was an amendment that passed that also exempted transit workers. And uh, you, you're part, of, part of why that was in there is because of your reporting. So what happened there, McKenna? Well, that's flattering. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the final version of the Senate bill passed late last month actually included an additional carve out of public transit worker unions. And as Sean kind of mentioned, that came after I, I think I first reported on it and then other media outlets picked it up as well. But um, I reported on concerns I'd heard from the main transit union, the Am Amalgamated Transit Union about how the requirements of this bill, including the ban on automatic payroll deductions for union dues, would threaten over $500 million in federal transit funds for public transit systems across the state. And that's because there are federal protections for transit employees that transit systems are required to meet in order to receive those funds. And that includes Hart in Tampa, for instance, and Lynx here in Orlando, where I am. And 
the Senate bill sponsor maintained to the end that he still didn't think that his bill would threaten those funds, but he amended the bill to include that carve out anyway. And in some interesting national context, Kentucky's de Democratic governor actually just vetoed a similar bill that would have like Florida's bill banned automatic dues deductions um, because of he heard similar things from the amalgamated transit union there and didn't want to risk it. If this bill does pass, and again, we're talking about HB 1445, which we'll hear have a committee stop this afternoon in the Florida House. It already passed the state Senate. It was called, uh, it's called SB uh, 256 there. Apologies for that. If it does pass, there will, will, will there be administrative costs to the state? What do we know about those administrative costs? And maybe is, is part of that what, Gruder, what Senator Gruders was getting at it about his opposition? Or am I mixing two things up now? I think Gruters had a different concern as far as the burden that it would place on the actual, the smaller unions in the state. But as far as the um, cost burden on the state and thereby taxpayers, the administrative costs of the legislation are still, even without that public transit worker uh, carve out, the administrative costs are still estimated to reach upward of over $900,000, according to a bill analysis that was put together by, um, I believe, the Senate and House um, staff. And that is administrative costs associated largely with um, if union, unions need to recertify if they go below the 60% membership threshold. But interestingly enough, I saw uh, investigative reporter Jason Garcia was tweeting about something. Um, the House and Budget, or the House and Senate budgets actually that were released for. Uh, the next fiscal year actually included an, an additional million dollars, I think, for the Public Employees Relations Commission, which would deal with these costs to account for the cost that the Senate bill, Senate Bill 256, would um, have on the state. So it looks like the Senate, and that was just in the Senate budget. I don't believe I saw that in the House budget. And eventually both have to come together to create like one budget. But that's in, that was very interesting to, to me to see that the Senate was already factoring in the additional $1 million it would take to account for what this bill could do to the state. So it'd be hard to call it a fiscally conservative bill if it's if the state's going to have to spend a million dollars just to administer this. Yeah, so the bill analysis actually describes the cost burden as ins insignificant. That doesn't sound super insignificant to me, but I'm not like a legislative policy analyst. Our guest is McKenna Schuler, a reporter for Orlando Weekly. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're talking about a bill that's going to be debated this afternoon at two in the Florida House State Affairs Committee, HB 1445, about unions. And we mentioned earlier that there was a carve out in this bill. It will affect all public sector unions except for some uh, like police unions, fire unions, and in the Senate, transit un union workers. Uh, let me ask you if that's that exemption is is in the House version. But uh, maybe I'll ask you that first, then I'll come back to my other question. Is is that same exemption for transit workers in the House version? I believe there's been an amendment or a committee substitute to try and make it so. I'm not sure completely to be fully transparent. So I'm looking forward to seeing in the House how that's discussed. And so getting back to the exemptions for the firefighters and police, the reason that was given in the bill for those unions being exempt is because they have long hours, they have, it, it would be difficult for them to do things to not have this automatic exemption. But then some of the Democrats who opposed the bill brought up, well, what about these other essential workers? I mean, they nurses and uh, 911 employees. Why, what was the rationale that Republicans gave for not including 911 employees, for example, in as an exemption in this bill? Yeah, so I think we did hear the Senate bill sponsor kind of explaining his own justification for it earlier on in the show. Um, but I have the quote in front of me that he sent me when I first asked about this, when he first filed the bill, he said, we are exempting law enforcement and firefighters because these brave heroes, this is a quote, often work second and third shifts while risking their lives to save others. I cannot in good conscience ask them after a 14 hour shift with no sleep to meet with union reps to give them their check. And I 
when I was talking to some workers about this um, legislation for the reporting I've been doing for Orlando Weekly, I read that exact quote to them and how insulting I think it was for some of these workers to hear that. So I spoke to especially like a few teachers and some faculty who, in addition to, um, you know, public health care workers who can work, as I heard through some of the committee stops, upwards of like 80 hours a week. Um, teachers also work really long shifts. They they pour themselves into this work and to kind of use the long hours thing, or uh, I think the Senate bill sponsor also used the term special risk. They're a special risk category. So they're a very special category of workers. Uh, whereas I guess teachers who also can face serious risks on the job as we've seen with mass school shootings and um, other behavioral struggles of students. Um, I think the carve out and the justification for it really just doesn't hold up for the public sector workers who would be affected by this legislation. At the beginning of the show, so before you joined us, we played some uh, Blaze Angolia, the sponsor of the bill. He was talking about why he was bringing this bill forward. And one of the reasons he said is by making the, the uh, threshold higher and so, and so on. He said his goal and he sounded super sincere about this, so I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to challenge him on that necessarily, but he said the goal of this bill is to push up union membership, to increase union membership, because if they have a 60% threshold, that, that higher threshold is going to mean that the union is going to have to be um, more receptive to, to members and, and to go out and, and have a more of a push for members. I want to hear what your thoughts are or the thoughts of the people that you've been interviewing are about Blaze and Golia's idea that this bill will increase, will, t will have the effect of increasing union membership. So first, to be generous to uh, the Senate bill sponsor, um, when the teachers unions were required to meet the 50% threshold under the 2018 law, um, they did, you know, have to push their membership up. But also in response to that, I would just say, if the bill were actually pro-union and meant to support and strengthen the unions, the unions would be supporting the legislation. And I don't see any union out there that's um, supporting this legislation. Um, and another thing I just wanted to bring up too that in, uh, the Senate bill sponsor was saying, um, I think he literally, I think he used the term giving workers a voice, making sure that workers are heard, which for me just seems horribly ironic because what we've seen throughout the committee stops for this legislation is literally dozens of workers showing up to committee stops for his bill to tell lawmakers to oppose the bill, including Republican and conservative union members who have said that this bill would um, infringe on their freedoms. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe today, McKenna. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I'm glad you could come on. McKenna Schuler is a reporter with Orlando Weekly. You can read her work at orlandoweekly.com. She used to be a reporter and anchor for WMNF. You can watch this interview on WMNF.org. Thank you to our phone screener and lighting engineer, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Many Floridians are losing their Medicaid eligibility. Shelly and her guests will tell you how to sign up for lower cost health insurance. Next up is Wavemakers. Jan Tom Scherberger will host Mario Nunez from Tampa Native Show. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on April 11th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. From NPR.